Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, I actually interviewed the authors Ken and Mary from The Humble Penny. So in this video, we're talking about financial freedom, specifically how they were able to become financially independent by the age of 34. Yes, you heard that right. We also spoke about their new book, Financial Joy. And if you do want to get that book, it will be linked in the description below for you. Plus they gave some really, really insightful tips on how to manage your money in this economy and honestly guys the amount of wisdom they gave in this interview you are just not ready so make sure you grab your tea your coffee have a sit down and let's get started with the interview ken and mary i wanted to thank you for coming on here to talk about financial independence and also financial joy I am so excited, but before we get started, I would love for you to just introduce yourselves, tell the people who you are and what you do. Yeah. Firstly, thank you so much for Veronia for having us. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's so good that we can actually be on your channel because yes. we absolutely love everything that you do as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Mary, mm -hmm. this is Ken, yep. significant other half, and <laughs> we run an online education platform called Financial Joy Academy and The Humble Penny. So we started off The Humble Penny in 2017 mm -hmm. as a blog and it has just grown on since to become something much bigger. And Financial Joy Academy is our sister sister company, um, which is an online membership. Yeah, and The Humble Penny lives on different platforms. Lives You can find it on YouTube at The Humble Penny or by the same name everywhere, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, pretty much, I don't know where else, but yeah, we're just having some fun creating content and sharing with a goal of ultimately helping people to achieve a life of financial joy. That's really the main goal of what we do. And we're a husband and wife team, been married for 13, coming on 13 years. And yeah, we enjoy doing Thank it. You. So yeah, Thank that's you. a bit about us. So I have been following you, I think since about 2018. Wow. Uh, it was on YouTube first. And then actually I used to read your blogs. If you didn't know, oh, I used to read your blogs sort of wow. before I'd be going to work and I'd be checking out. So wow. I've, I've been, yeah, I've been a major fan. And you were one of the people that actually encouraged me to start thinking about things like financial independence because I'd never heard of it before. I was just kind of taught to go to school, you know, get a job. I went to a grammar school. It was all great. Then, you know, go to university, get a good job and realize that, you know, there's maybe something else that God has for us in terms of our lives. So I know that based on the content that you've done, a lot of it will come from your past experiences as well. So I would love to know, what was it like growing up with money? Mm. Do you want to start or should I start? You Maybe you go first. Okay. So, um, Growing up, I just remember my parents being frugal. Mm. Um, so I am a second generation immigrant. My parents migrated to London in the late 70s. Mm. And yeah, I just remember the, the, some of the vivid memories I have was that my parents were always sending money back home to Nigeria. Mm. So this, essentially the money that they made wasn't just for, for us and to make a living and to provide for, for the family. It mm. was always to to provide for people back home, like relatives. Mm. And, and basically they were quite generous, but they were also quite frugal. Yeah. And so by frugal, I mean like we didn't go on holidays. We never ever did holidays. Wow. Um, we never ever ate out at restaurants. It was always, there was rice at There's home. There's rice at home. <laughs> but there was always an abundance of like fresh cooked. Abundance you know, of rice. Abundance of rice, <laughs> jollof rice and all of that um, Nigerian food that we and yeah, I just remember having like my little savings book. We went to Santander when it used to be called mm. Abbey National. It was like a red savings book. And I just remember in primary school having that. And I loved seeing um, my savings and seeing the money like just add up and, and grow. And essentially that's what I remember, just saving a lot of my money, all the pocket money that I had and um, the little kind of entrepreneurial things I did in secondary school, like making CDs mm -hmm. and selling it in a playground. I just loved to Not see that. that money coming in and saving <laughs> it. <laughs> and and I guess that's where my financial education or my financial literacy, or should I say my money blueprint stemmed from, just things that I picked up from my parents and my brothers growing up. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, me. For me, uh, money was a, it's an interesting topic because I guess a big turning point for my life was actually emigrating to the UK when I was 14. And mm. that big turning point 
meant a lot because money, there was no money, let's put it that way. We began at zero. Mm. And when you moved to the UK back then, you know, being Nigerian was not cool. There was no Afrobeat, I tell you now, like there's no like, <laughs> there's no burner boy making us like look cool. It was hard. It was hard. I got picked on a lot and, mm. you know, starting at year 11 in school, money was hard. We didn't have any money. And plus there's many challenges with residency in the UK, which meant that mm. you couldn't just go and claim for stuff, NHS or go and get a normal job. So it just meant like, just not having money was like, you felt like you were not only poor, but you were isolated. And it was clear that in the UK, like if you didn't have money, like, whew, you're going to struggle, you know? So, mm. so that was very, very hard. My parents had to get lots of menial jobs. My, my mom, for example, had three jobs, yeah. washing dishes, you know, um, doing loads of admin, working at Walthamstow Dogs in East London, She'd go from one to the other to the other. You know, my dad did checkout work. And so it was very, very difficult finding mm. our feet. And that began to shape our relationship with money. I, I really knew even as, as early as that, that I wanted a way out. I didn't know the phrase financial independence. I just knew that, you know what? Same. I wanted to make it in this country. I wanted yeah. to like, mm. I wanted to break out somehow, but it wasn't easy to do that because how do you do that? Who do you, they were not role models. I didn't see anyone I could point to and go, I want to be like him or her or them. There's nobody. It was just like, until eventually we'd get at some point to read books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which started to kind of just open our minds up to this other way of looking at money, which then connected to actually Mary and I meeting in 2009, again at a property conference actually, um, which was actually a turning point for us beginning that journey together to dream together and say, do you know what? Yeah, man, this is what we want. Yeah, we want that freedom, you know, we want that independence. So yeah, I hope that gives you a bit of a, a bit of context for our journey. Yeah, I love that, and I think it it's so interesting to hear both of your experiences where you know you know like parents would have emigrated into the UK, and you know I I think especially when you see a lot of people of colour, so black people as well, uh, the struggles that they do have, they maybe don't have the same privileges as other people. So I definitely, I definitely resonate with that. Uh, my mum also came to the UK, um, but she ended up being a single mum as well. So we didn't grow up with a lot of money, but she also made some sacrifices in that she actually left the country for a few years to work to get more money. So yeah, I definitely resonate with with that. And I you spoke about the turning point in terms of thinking about financial independence and you know reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, going to a property seminar. I absolutely loved that. When did you decide that actually this was the time that you were going to start working towards financial independence? And I also would love to know how did you define financial independence at that time? Hmm. So great question. I can think back to a key turning point for Mary and I was when we um, we were on we were on our holiday. It was our first holiday together. It was our first one, two thousand and ten, yeah. early early two thousand ten. Like our third, second. Oh, okay, okay, I can't yeah. remember now. But we're on a holiday. We're on a holiday, and um, we were engaged, mm -hmm. and we travelled together. And one thing I remember very clearly was that we. We decided on that trip, as we were planning for our, our wedding, wedding mm -hmm. <laughs> that, do you know what? We want to create for ourselves a 10-year a plan. Mm -hmm. Like, what did we want out of our lives? Like, what did we want? Like, if we could define it, a, pen, a bit of a picture, what, what did we mm -hmm. want? And some of the core elements of that was that we wanted to own our own home, for example. We wanted to own that home outright, mortgage-free eventually. We wanted to, what else do you remember? We wanted to have children, for example. Yeah, we wanted to have children. Um, we wanted to travel. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do um, charitable works mm -hmm. and just have that freedom to be able to do the things that um, was purposeful um, and brought some meaning into our lives. And so, yeah, it was, it was really powerful, actually, because yeah. we really, I don't know what made us come up with that, that 10 year plan because we were really planning our wedding. Mm, and yeah. sometimes people can just get stuck on planning the wedding yeah. and not really focus on planning for the future. The, the life ahead. But we did mm. both and it we was, it both. really helped to shape. And 
speed up that trajectory for us. I think it was partly because we were in a different environment as well. Yes, we changed the environment. We changed the environment. We were on the beach. Yeah. It, beautiful <laughs> it was beach in, in Zanzibar, Zanzibar, by the way. Zanzibar, yeah, yeah, yeah. A remote beach in, in Pongwe, Pongwe, Zanzibar. Yeah. And I guess the environment was, was right for us to be able it to just... dream without having the restrictions of, you know, just things like, you know, you didn't have to worry about, at that moment about paying bills or washing up children or children mm, work yeah. we were on holiday so yeah. we had that freedom and yeah. the capacity to dream not the washing up together. plates yeah no, yeah <laughs> no, no yeah no grocery shopping to do <laughs> no, no like you know it was literally and there was no netflix this is the thing do you remember there was no reception. there was no there's no reception there's no, oh, there no internet there's no mobile wow. phones yeah. it was literally you like in like just think of the most beautiful beach you could think of there's no tv in fact if you could put it up i'll try to we'll send you a photo to put up like maybe on the the idea yep. it was just there was no internet it's literally like you're in like the middle of like the most beautiful place yeah and all you could do was dream mm. that was it yeah. as is another thing we forgot isn't it it's the in, no internet there's no TV. There's, there's no mobile. No, no, we didn't. We yeah. couldn't. So I had my SLR camera, so we could take pictures on the SLR. So there was no. There was no like smartphone for us to take pictures of. So it's 2010 uh, back then. Yeah. So it made a big difference. I remember like the dreams was uh, was so specific. Like you wanted a kitchen with an island. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted off road parking at home. So we we went we went to that level of detail. Mm. But we also wanted to start to invest in the stock market properly, which we started to do in 2010, which would mm. play a key role because that was the emergence of kind of life after that global financial crisis and the whole world was, was gradually starting to recover. So beginning that period, no one knew, and this is the key thing, no one knew how the future would turn out. Just as no one knows now how the future would turn out. It, it, it's about taking that step of faith. You realize, you know what? I believe that this is where we're going. We're going in 10 years is where we want to get to, but we're going to take certain, you know, faith walks right now. We're going to take mm. certain steps, which we're like investing, trying to get on the property ladder. Pay off our mortgage. Perfect. Staying, staying to work towards paying off the mortgage, staying to yeah. really level up in our career, starting mm. to explore side hustles, you know, just starting to just do things together. This is the mm. thing. Yeah. And actually, and you may come to this later, but one of the reasons we notice why people never get to achieving their goals is because for those who are in a relationship for example they are never together on like they're never on yeah. the same page when it comes to like goals and vision and that kind of thing yeah so yeah anyway uh, and then you yeah. asked us well, what was our definition um so we kind of looked at it back then we were looking at the american definition which was the they use this four percent rule but that definition since expanded because the uk is slightly different actually something we talk about a lot in our book uh, we use a 3.5% rule instead for the UK based on a lot of research. Mm. Um, or the alternative definition um, is where income from any assets, mm -hmm. such as your net worth effectively, uh, is able to cover any cover your monthly essential expenses. So that's one definition. The second one that I talked about, the 4% rule, which was what we were using back then, was um, where essentially your net worth eventually becomes around 25 times your annual expenses but it's it's actually that four percent is more of an american definition uh, a better definition for the uk to take how much you are say spending for example um divide per annum divide up by 3.5 percent or 0.035 so that grosses up almost like a rough calculation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so yeah that kind of gives people a bit of context yeah no, it, it it makes sense. And I absolutely love the idea of you being on the beach somewhere, no distractions, truly dreaming. And I think the difference is you weren't just saying, oh, we just want to buy a house and then pay off the mortgage. Actually, you went into much more detail. What did you want the house to look like? What did, you know, what did financial joy, I guess, mean for you in that respect? So I absolutely, I absolutely love that. So I guess my question is then... And I, and I assume that you actually talk about this in the book, but what was the journey like? How did you achieve it? There's some, do you want to start talking about it first of all? 
Yeah, so we, um, for people who don't know, we achieved financial independence aged 34, including paying off our mortgage in seven years whilst we were raising two boys. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't easy. It definitely wasn't easy. But one thing that we did was that we focused on combining our incomes, um, like Ken mentioned earlier, that we did things together. Mm-hmm. So in mm-hmm. that we had one pot, his salary, my salary went into one pot mm-hmm. and we lived on one salary. Yes. And the other mainly one salary. Mainly one salary and the other salary <coughs> we put into pumping into paying um making extra payments on our mortgage mm-hmm. every month, but also investing in a stock market in, in our stocks and shares I so and putting it into our pensions. Pensions. Can I just chip in one thing? Mm. Just that point around combining income. Mm. I just want to speak to single people. Yes. Just because there's two mm-hmm. of us doesn't mean that as if you're a single person you can't become financially independent. Of mm-hmm. course you can, because everything comes back to really how much you're spending and you know to what extent you're able to carve out a portion of your income to save and invest over time right so you just wanted to share that it's yeah, obviously we'll come to it's obviously it, it, it's obviously harder there is a singles tax and this is a much more yeah you know, much more delicate conversation there is definitely a singles tax mm. that exists and we talk about this in the books there's lots of things that stop people like black tax singles tax there's various mm. wealth gaps there are many things we can talk about but i just want to encourage single people to say look you know you can get to that level but it requires a lot of intention but sorry to uh, yeah stop no you. no it's a good point to make um we also created a 10 year plan Mm -hmm. and we had a vision which we spoke about earlier, Mm -hmm. um, which really helped us to stay disciplined and focused on our North Star goal. Mm -hmm. Um, What else? We focused on lifestyle simplification. And so what we wanted to do was to increase our savings rates. At one point we had a savings rate of 60%. 65%. 65% at one Mm -hmm. time uh, and we lived on the rest. And but it's worth chipping in that yeah. it didn't start at sixty five percent. No, it didn't. Because I want to be real. Because like mm. sometimes when you hear these things, like whoa, whoa, hang on, I want to be real. It started at zero. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it took. What were some examples? Let's give some real context. What were some examples of things that we changed? that helped to increase that savings rate. Yeah, so I grew up, even though my parents were quite frugal, we always shopped like good quality food. So we shopped at Sainsbury's all the time. And Ken had this crazy idea of sticking to a 50 pounds food budget, weekly food budget for family of four. And that wasn't just food that included everything else, like toiletries and stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) And I I really thought it was a ridiculous budget, but... I was so tired of Ken constantly asking me, babe, what was the bill? How much did it, what did it cost? Yeah. yeah babe, <laughs> For a week. I was like, leave, let's see the receipt. I begged, leave me alone. It got to a point where I was like, do you know what? I'm going to challenge myself to actually stick to that Can't £50 food budget. And mm. I was able to by um, changing supermarkets, started shopping at um, Audi, for example, started buying store-bought um, products instead of the name-branded ones, mm. started to cook in bulk, in batch, like what I was used to seeing my meal parents planning. do anyway. We did meal planning and mm. really stuck to it. And we were both working our corporate jobs at the mm-hmm. time. So we stopped buying food for lunch. We literally just, mm. whatever I made the night before, I took it into work the next day as packed. And if lunch. we didn't have food, I'd stop off at co-op and get the meal deal. The meal deal. <laughs> which I think was £3.50, the yeah. co-op meal deal, yeah, so, yeah. at Charing Cross Station. Mm-hmm. So we do stuff like that. So that was know. one practical example. Um, another example is that we we, sw- we swapped cars. So we used to drive the German guzzlers. Audi. Audis, yeah, which were a lot of maintenance. So the constant <sighs> repairs that we... It, it was just a drainer. <laughs> It, it drained us oh, of, all our, of all our money. We switched to a second-hand um, electric car. And so our running costs reduced significantly. Um, significantly. It literally cost like £30 a month to run our electric car. Mm-hmm. So we were able to charge it on the drive and... Um, yeah, and we paid cash for the car. Money. Paid yeah. nine grand, not mm-hmm. financing or anything. Like, just paid yeah. nine grand for it. Bought it. And we've still got the same car today. You know, still use it. Which means like... That car costs us ne- less than a grand a year in like total costs, including depreciation. It's mad, isn't yeah, it? It's yeah. like super cheap to run that car. In fact, last night you forgot the car open. Oh. Like we sometimes forget the car open. Like, no, one, <laughs> no one's gonna like try and jack it, you know? Because it's just no. like it's just like yeah. yeah no worries. <laughs> so it's just stuff like that, you know. Like and also this is a difficult one, but we and I know this is a slightly delicate topic, but we we just chose to stop at two kids. Mm. And I know this is a slightly hard topic because people, some people can't have children, yeah. some people, but it's worth mm. just talking about it. And that like, people who have five kids and who have like, 
You know, you're like, because children cost money. Like, I'm, you know, I'm just being real. <laughs> like, I, I run it on a spreadsheet and I'm like, whoa, like, yeah. the cost of being a parent is no joke. It's true. It's true. Especially when you yeah. have a particular kind of lifestyle, um, you want to give them a particular life. To, it, yeah. Yeah, it can, it can cost. And it, it does add up for sure. Um, yeah, so many other things. Like, we just stopped buying clothes unnecessarily. <sighs> Uh, I, I was doing that, I was doing my own hair. I wasn't doing my nails. Just oh, we we did no Netflix. We didn't have any um, Amazon Prime at the time or Sky. It was really just we had YouTube. um the one you what's that one you get for free again uh, called we had BBC iPlayer but it was another uh, the one that comes with the TV yeah free free view that's it. <laughs> <laughs> We were just a bit um, hardcore at the time. We were hardcore, but, but then, but we, but then we started changing that. Yeah, but then we started changing that, you know, because yeah. we still left spaces for things. We enjoyed travelling. So travelling was our was guilty pleasure. So we still had fun. Mm. People were like, oh, well, you're, maybe you're too um, too extreme. No, no, we still had fun. But we had free fun, affordable fun, or fun that was planned according yeah. to a budget. Yeah, yeah. So we'd collect all these obvious points, companion vouchers. We'd like plan things ahead. Like 12 to 24 months ahead, we're planning our travels to, just to make sure we're getting the best deals without overpaying for hotels or flights and yeah. other stuff like that. Yeah, we focused on career maximization. So Ken, you, he did an MBA. Um, I retrained. Um, yeah, child, I got a childcare qualification. There was an opportunity to expand the family nursery business, which Ken's mum started. And so mm -hmm. I left the corporate world when I was three months pregnant to run um, a nursery branch, branch in mm -hmm. London. So that was a total, total change Touch. for me. And that saved a load of childcare costs. Saved a lot of childcare costs as well, which then got invested. Mm, yeah. You know exactly all that money that we made from Ken's career maximization and and getting an MBA. He was able to negotiate a better salary mm -hmm. and all of that, and all of that money, extra money that we made, we then pumped it into um, investing. Oh, Stock other market, assets. Um, property and so on yeah you know so it was a in fact there's a lot we could talk about but it was it's just why which is why we wrote the book it's worth mentioning because there's so much to this that it's there's com there's complicated and a lot of the time you don't know what to do first it can seem quite overwhelming it's like which step do i mm -hmm. take first that's why we wrote the book in a really the book's a 10 week plan it's literally like okay week one Here's what to do. Week two, here's what to do. All the way to week 10. And each week is covering different areas. Um, you know, right from the beginning where you're trying to establish what financial joy looks like for you, all the way to uh, sorting out your relationship with money, dealing with debt, you know, then going to where you start to grow your money, you know, investing. You know, it carries on, carries on across looking at retirement, how do you become, begin that financial freedom journey, yeah. how do you invest in property, what are the strategies, like everything's in the book. But the reason I mention that is, is it can be overwhelming. I told you, I think I said, did I say on this call, that 95% of people, no, you haven't said it yet. I haven't said it, around 95% of people, according to research, never become financially independent because it's never a go in the first place. Mm. Mm. It was never a go. Do you understand? So and yeah. for, for people, a lot of the reasons why it was never a goal is because, number one, they don't know anyone else who they can point to. Well, today you do. It's Ken and Mary who you can point to. But number two is, is they don't know how to begin. There's so many, like, what step do I take first? Okay, I'm trying to get on a property ladder. But how do I do that whilst I'm doing other things? How do I invest whilst I'm doing other things? So mm. it can be very overwhelming for people yeah. to say, what's my first step? To the point where people are just like, you know what? Forget, forget about that one. Mm. It can't, it's not realistic. I can't do it. Yeah. But we want to show you it's realistic. Like Mary and I, we've just turned, should we say our age? <laughs> we just, okay. we just turned You mentioned it on YouTube already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, to yeah, we, 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 we celebrated our 40th, right? So we've been, we, we, you know, we've been doing this now for, when I say doing, we've been living this financially independent life for six years, right? Mm -hmm. So it's possible. And bear in mind, like, this is, we haven't inherited a penny. Like, I haven't walked into, like, some trust fund or Mary. Like, so to begin somewhere, I'm just sharing that to help people understand that there's a lot of inner doubt that people have that's self-invented. There's, it like, self-invented inner doubt. You put the wall and you're like, oh, I can't get past this wall where this wall is invented by you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But there is a way around which is why we're trying to educate people using real life experiences 
our journey is based on reality, not like theory or some random mm -hmm. ideas, it's based on like what we've actually done. So we're trying to educate people for them to know that, you know what, I can relate to these people, I can relate to their background, I can relate to their journey, I can follow what they've done to get to a particular outcome myself. Yeah, I love that. So, so many gems. And I do want to talk about the book, actually. Um, it will be linked in the description and the comments, so make sure you do check it out, Financial Joy. Um, but what I wanted to ask is, obviously, you started off with the blogs, and then you, you did YouTube channels, and you would have done, you know, so many different things, like speaking opportunities. What actually prompted you to write this book because I remember I'm part of Financial Joy Academy it was one of the 5 a.m meetings and you actually mentioned you were thinking about writing a book and that's now come into fruition so I would love to know what prompted you to actually do it wow well do you want to speak to this or shall um, I yeah go on <laughs> okay okay so you're talking about so firstly thank you to about Financial Joy Academy it's interesting the Financial Joy Academy came before Financial Joy the book um, so financial joy is a concept, it's a, it's, it's a mindset and a, uh, a lifestyle effectively, if I had to explain what it means. So financial joy is two worlds coming together that never ordinarily exist. The financial world is about the money journey that people are on. A lot of people are trying to become financially independent or become financially free. But they often focus on that so much at the cost of the second world that most people don't think about, which is the joy element, which is about prioritizing their well-being, about prioritizing fun, you know, purpose-led work, all those mm. things. So this book brings together wealth, which is the financial piece, your journey towards becoming financially free, and joy, which is the well-being, and blends them together in a step-by-step -step approach. The subheading is Banish Debt, Grow Your Money, and Unlock Financial Freedom in 10 Weeks. Now, why did we write the book? We wrote the book because we believe very strongly that financial joy is accessible to everyone. everyone. Yes. Accessible to everyone. Yeah. Why? Because everyone's definition of financial joy would differ. You mm -hmm. see, in week one of this book would get you to actually define what financial joy looks like for you in a very practical way. And we share, Mary and I share what ours is and to guide people into deciding what theirs is. And this is important because then if you define that, you can start to enjoy that life of financial joy even today. Even if you are just, even if you've only got a thousand pounds in a bank account, mm -hmm. even if you're just starting out in your career, you know, if you've moved ahead and you're at a stage where you are, uh, you've got more financial security. So for everybody, you can begin to enjoy it. And for us, we wrote this book because we believed that financial joy as a, a vision will help people to live that balanced life of wealth and well-being. That way, they're not just like, you know how like when you are saving, saving, investing, investing, you're not really enjoying your life. Mm -hmm. You always feel like mm -hmm. you're, there's extreme frugality and that, that's one extreme. Mm -hmm. But then the other extreme of that is you are living just for today. Yeah, and, and, and that's all. And then you have that anxiety of, oh, I'm not preparing for the future. Financial joy helps you to have that balance so that you're not experiencing that FOMO or you're not experiencing that all the extremes of extreme frugality or mm -hmm. the, the other extreme of I'm only living for today, YOLO, you only live mm -hmm. once. But you're in between that where you've actually designed a life that's custom to you, that's intentional to you, and it doesn't require you comparing yourself to other people. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, he, he's, made, he's said it all, really. And I guess the important point to, to, to drum down is that um, sometimes people can look from afar and say, oh, financial joy is not for me, or I can't achieve this maybe because of my background, because of my colour, um, because of my social status, my class. But no, we're saying it like what Ken said, it is accessible to everybody, even today, starting from humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that you have a plan in place can give you that reassurance, you know that what? peace of That's... mind, less anxiety, less stress. That is, that what you just said there, just knowing yeah. I've got a plan in place. Yes, yeah. Because most people don't have a plan. And most people are just like, mm. paycheck, that paycheck to paycheck cycle mm. just destroys their confidence. There's always anxiety. Yeah. But just knowing that, this is what the book is, just knowing that, you know what, with this, I've got, and by the way, do you like the spun? It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just knowing that I've got a, a game plan. Yeah. Do you know how, because a lot of financial stress comes from 
knowing that you can't navigate day to day, but you also have anxiety that you're not preparing for the future. Yes. That eight, that causes yeah. a lot of people financial stress and anxiety. But knowing that you've actually got a plan and you're working towards something, a plan that's custom designed for you, mm. just gives you a lot of peace. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, I love that. And like, I guess linked to that, because obviously this, this book is made for everyone. But I'm also wondering, what kind of mindset do you think someone needs to have before going into the book, before actually starting to read the book? I think the sort of mindset someone needs to have before they start reading the book is that they are fed up of the status quo. Being that a lot of people don't, you know, like you look at it around the country, look at the UK, right? A lot of people are just, if you just don't well, read comments on people's, you know, uh, videos, YouTube videos, look at some comments that people post. So there's a lot of frustration that people are experiencing. Mm. The cost of living crisis is literally crushing a lot of people. Cost of living is very high. Yeah. We're all paying a lot of taxes. There's just a lot of frustration. But I believe very strongly that the sort of person who will really enjoy a book like this is someone who believes that even though things are so bad for me, I can turn my life around. Mm. There is a way out of this situation. I don't believe that my current reality is my only reality mm-hmm. that somehow with the right guidance and i know there's a lot of misinformation on the internet but with the right guidance i can find my way out and i'm re- i'm determined to put the work in mm-hmm. because make no mistake none of what we're saying will come just by all you've done is read, read a book no there's work to be done the book is very practical inside the book there's tasks to be done there's spaces for you to fill things in there's things, there are times for you to reflect. If you're single, you reflect on your own or speak to somebody who you, you know, you trust to reflect and keep you accountable. If you've got, got a partner, you do it with them. Yeah. So there's the work to be done. So I think part of that mindset is, I believe I can change my life and I just need the tool and the guidance to help me. And secondly, I am prepared to put the work in, to yeah. make the sacrifices, to open my mindset. That's the other thing as well is some people are like, they just have a closed mindset. Maybe you can maybe you can fix mine. Maybe you can speak yeah. to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything you said. And essentially, um, Veronia, I'd say that you need to have one of a growth mindset and of a, an abundance mindset because your current situation, like Ken said, it doesn't have to be that way forever. Mm-hmm. And if you're constantly um, thinking about where you are now, it stops you from dreaming, you know, having that abundance mindset of a way of thinking. So knowing mm-hmm. that, you're not a tree, like you're not stuck in the same position. You can mm-hmm. grow, you can evolve, but you have to do the hard work. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's just a way to look at it, that you can change over time by just having a discipline, having a plan in place, following a 10-week <laughs> um, plan, which we, we've got here. You can definitely see the change happening. And it's sure. not guesswork. That's the main thing. Because a lot of the time, mm. people are guessing. They're like, well, should I do this or should I do that? Should I do that or should I do that? No. Don't guess. Just, mm. just follow the plan. It's it's been tried and tested, not by random people on the internet who are trying to help you get rich quick. That's not what we're here to do. We mm. know it takes a while to build wealth, but we're trying to help you through a tried and tested approach to doing it. You know, in a way that means that you actually build sustainable wealth over time. So yeah. Yeah. I absolutely, I absolutely love that. So many gems. So if you have not got the book yet please, please do. I already, I ordered my book from the start as soon as they mentioned it. And then I bought another one as well. I was like, well, I'm getting another one. So please do. Again, as I mentioned, it will be linked in the description and also the comments as well. Um, So the last question, I guess, that I have is, especially for people in my audience, they tend to be kind of in their mid to late twenties, go, you know, start of their thirties, going into their forties. What's one advice you would give someone who is probably at that age, just hearing about things like financial independence and they want to get started? So one thing we would say, read a book, Financial Joy. Um, It's a 10 week plan and each week has um, really practical exercises that you can do. Uh, It has 
boxes where you can fill it in very 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 practical um but another thing would say is to just start by minimizing your lifestyle mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. things that we talked about lifestyle simplification very so important. important um save and invest your money from now because when you're young Ooh. you have the time you have the energy the momentum the momentum mm -hmm. and, you know whereas you know in the next 10 years we don't know what could happen there's so, much so many things wrong. that can happen you know health related issues yeah. or whatever life happens so while Whilst you're young, in your prime, and you have the energy, save your money and invest wisely. Mm -hmm. I'll add yeah. to that. Look, you're in your 20s. You're in your prime, right? Your yeah. 20s, your 30s. These are like, these are the years when, like, you should be firing on all cylinders. Imagine you've got, like, seven cylinders. Don't be firing on three. Like, <laughs> I know you want to do the stuff life. You want to do what everyone's doing. But you need to work hard before you then start to work smart. A lot of people who've actually built wealth have had to work hard. And there's a lot of this like anti-work hard like message out there. But I'm telling you right now, if you don't work hard in your 20s, you will suffer in your 30s and you'll suffer in your 40s. So I'm saying to you, if you're in your 20s, you need to be put in the work. And by that, I mean, use your God-given inbuilt creativity to explore other ways to make more money. Create side hustles. Get into joint ventures with people. Go and learn from other communities. Join memberships. Join spaces where people are inspiring other people. Don't be subscribed to this scarcity way of thinking where you think the whole world, everyone's fighting over one pizza. And if one person takes one piece of the pizza, then you're, you've got less of the pizza left over. No, many pizzas can be created. A hundred pizzas can be created. A thousand pizzas can be created. So my point to you is this. You need to be out there making things happen. Don't let anyone tell you that in your 20s that things aren't possible for you. Even if you get made redundant in your job, see that as a blessing for the next best thing that will come. My point is, in your 20s, you need to be on cylinder number seven, like firing, 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 trying different things. Even if you make mistakes, even if you fail at stuff, get up and keep trying other stuff. Because without it, you won't build the muscle for what you need to... Grow your income. Because think about it. In your 20s, not only do you have the power of compounding waiting yeah. to work for you the next 10, 20 years, but think about how your income could grow. In fact, let me sow one seed into someone's mind right now. Mm. Imagine if you had the goal to double your income every three years. I bet you if you had that in your mind, which someone sowed in my mind when I was doing my MBA at Cambridge, when it sowed that idea in my mind, I was like, do you know what? I take you up on the challenge. And I bet you... Anyone who does that, provided as your income's rising, you're not suffering that lifestyle creep, mm. you're going to be fine. Keep your lifestyle simple, like Mary said. And as you create that more income and your buffer increases, make sure your savings rate is increasing. Make sure you're not comparing yourself to other people, but you're leveling up and investing that money because you know who wants to work till they're 65. No offense to anyone who's 65. But if you really want to enjoy your life later on, then you need to be putting that money to work right now. That's yeah, it. and just to add to that, and I love everything you've said, it's all about, you know, to say know thyself. Um, there is, when you're young, you kind of like want to just keep up with the Joneses or do what everyone say you should do or what's popular, what's the message yeah. being pumped out on social media. But, you know, all of that, you know, self-reflection, that introspection, like really knowing who you are and being confident in mm -hmm. yourself. And a lot of that is from, you know, just learning, you know, putting yourself in situations where you're um, in a growth you're trying out new things and like you have the opportunity to learn new things. So definitely knowing who you are as a person, being confident in yourself would mean that you won't feel that you need to impress other people hmm. and kind of that can then delay you from reaching the goal that you want to reach. What are examples of things that people don't need to do to impress other people? Oh, I guess... Simple things like buying designer clothing or wearing, looking, you know, going to expensive restaurants like Hakkasan or whatever and capturing posting it, it, post, it just so you can share social. it on Insta. What else? Just you don't need expensive to, holidays. You don't need to do so that just so you can show that like you're successful. And we know this because I know this because I I did that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's a mistake. Like I'm sharing that from like real life. It's like you look like you're doing well, but truth be told, deep down, you're broke and you're probably one paycheck away from everything crashing if you lost your job. That's not yeah. really where anybody mm. wants to be. Mm. The true freedom is in, I've got six months worth of expenses. I've got three years worth of expenses. Mm. I've got 20 years, and it will get there, 20 years worth of expenses. 
it will get there if you approach your life with some design, mm -hmm. you know. And to Mary's point, self awareness combined with seeking expansion, pff, boy, mm. you're gonna be laughing. Oh yes, you'll be unstoppable. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I think there was just there was just so much there, and I I think what I'm really hearing is being intentional with your life and, and what you feel like God wants you to do and just not comparing yourself to anyone and really thinking about your own journey. So I absolutely love that. Um, Ken and Mary, how can people connect with you? What are the next steps? Of course, it is to get the book. Please, please get the book. But how can people also connect with you as well? Yes. So like you said, like we said, get the book. You can get it from all major um, book retailers like Amazon, uh, Waterstones. And yeah, so you can get it online. Otherwise, we are on YouTube at The Humble Penny mm -hmm. um, and on, Insta in, on Instagram and on TikTok. We also have a blog, thehumblepenny.com, mm -hmm. where we publish blog blog posts once a week. Oh, and by the way, you can buy this not just online, but offline. You can buy it anywhere. Waterstone. Waterstone. Just walk into your bookshops, yeah. buy it. But please, can we just make a big favour? Please order a physical copy. Mary and I have got a dream. Our dream is to become Sunday Times bestsellers. Yes. We believe it's possible. It. So buy, buy more than one if your budget allows it. Buy some as a gift for your loved ones. Because trust me, like this book will change people's financial destinies. So please buy copies. And you know, follow what we're doing. You know, uh, Veronia has been part of our community. And we've really loved getting to know Veronia and you know, on this journey together. So follow what we're doing. Feel free to connect with us, like Mary said, at The Humble Penny everywhere. Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's another one. Oh, yes. Yes, LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're more than happy to connect with you. But yeah, may financial Perfect. joy become your reality, as we say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming on here. And again, links will be all in the description and comments, but a massive thank you for allowing me to interview you today. Oh, thank you so thank much you for having us. It's been great. So I really hope you enjoyed that interview like I did. And if you did, make sure you do give this video a thumbs up. Plus, let me know in the comments what's one thing you took away from this interview. I do post every Sunday and if you are completely new to my channel, I talk about ways to help you save more money. So if you would like to know more, then consider subscribing. But thank you guys so much and I will see you next Sunday with another video.